Thank you very much and uh, thanks again, Filippo, for the kind invitation. Um, my talk today is about the new insight in different subtypes of macular neovascularization. Here my disclosure. So, you know that uh, um, these are the three goals of my presentation. I would like uh, that at the end of the presentation uh, you can say that non-exudative macular neovascularization are high-risk lesion for exudation. Uh, the second goal is that thanks to the multimodal imaging now we are able to detect the preclinical stages of uh, uh, exudative macular neovascularization. And the last goal is that subretinal fluid is not always a good predictor of visual outcome after the therapy with antivascular endothelial factor injection. You know that neovascular age-related macular degeneration is the advanced stage of MD uh, with the geographic atrophy. And you also know that there are three different subtypes of macular neovascularization uh, that were described by Donald Gass and after that uh, Bailey Freund expanded this uh, anatomical classification introducing the term of type 3 macular neovascularization. In the first part of my presentation, I would like uh, to give you some tips about the new multimodal imaging characterization of uh, type 1 macular neovascularization. You know that the region of this kind of nerve vessel is the corocapillaris, in which there is the growth of nerve vessel uh, in the sub RP space. And here you can see the correspondence between this cartoon and structural CT, in which there is a, a pigment epithelium detachment. The nerve vascularization is located between the retinal pigment epithelium and the Brooks membrane, and usually there is exudation in terms of subretinal fluid. However, uh, some years ago, my mentor, Professor Querquest, described for the first time the quiescent choroidal neovascularization. Why the term quiescent? Quiescent because uh, quiescent uh, is characterized by inactivity, so there is no exudation in this kind of nerve vessels, and also no symptoms. Uh, usually patients affected by this kind of neovascularization don't have uh, any kind of visual decline. Uh, sometimes uh, any metamorphopsia, but no visual decline. And uh, in the first description, that is uh, in this publication, you can see that there is a uh, um, late uh, hyperfluorescent plaque in the late phases of uh, ICGA. You can see again uh, the pigment epithelium detachment, but there is no signs of exudation, no sign of subretinal fluid. And uh, for definition, this uh, was uh, for at least two examination with six months apart. And after that, there was the introduction of OCT angiography. Uh, in this uh, first publication of our group, uh, we described the utility of uh, OCT angiography in the detection of uh, quiescent macular neovascularization. But we have detected that the sensitivity is not 100%, is only 82%. In fact, you can see here in this case, you can see using dye angiography, this is again an ICG angiography, you can see the uh, hyperfluorescent plaque in the late phases of examination, so a type 1 macular neovascularization, no exudation, and so a quiescent uh, type 1 macular neovascularization. But you can see that using two different devices, you are not able to detect the neovascularization. So uh, when you have and I suspicious of uh, uh, the presence of uh, macular neovascularization, quiescent macular neovascularization. Uh, also again, if you don't have any kind of neovascularization, you need to perform a dye angiography because sometimes OCT angiography fail to detect the presence of macular neovascularization. Enrico has told before that probably this is due uh, to a very, very slow flow that was not detectable by OCT angiography. And we have also described in this second paper um, the natural history of this kind of neovascularization. And you can see that in 7% of cases, there was uh, um, activation, an exudation in the first year of follow-up. And this percentage increased during the second year of, uh, of follow-up. In fact, there are some kind of publication today that reported about 40% of exudation in the first two years uh, of follow-up. So, if you have a quiescent macular neovascularization on the baseline, you need to follow your patient very strictly because this kind of neovascular is a very high risk lesion and uh, you need to detect uh, 
the activation during the follow-up. After uh, our first papers, another group, the group of Fier Rosenfeld, reported the term non-exudative macronevascularization. The difference is uh, in the timing, because for definition, quiescent macronevascularization needs to be uh, without any kind of exudation for at least uh, six months. Uh, in this kind, non-exudative macular nevascularization is a one-shot timing. So if you have a flat pigment epithelium detachment with a nevascularization, you can see that this is a non-exudative macular nevascularization without any kind of follow-up. And probably for this reason, the rate of activation at the baseline, uh, sorry, after one year follow-up, was higher in comparison to our series, 21%. For this reason, we have uh, uh, performed uh, another study in order to try to identify uh, some biomarkers that could predict the activation of nevascularization. This is very important from a clinical point of view because if you know that at the baseline you detect a non-exudative macronevascularization that probably uh, develop exudation in a few months, you need to follow your patient very strictly. We have included several patients in three different centers, and I would like to show you our results. We have um, identified two different uh, groups of patients. In the first group of patients, and there was a, a macronovascularization with uh, no exudation or uh, exudation after uh, um, more than six months. And this kind of patients were characterized by a macronovascularization with, uh, you can see here, large vessels, low rate of capillaries, and also after, after binarization and skeletonization, uh, you can see that the number of capillaries was very low. There are only uh, great vessels. On the other hand, if we uh, analyze patients that develop exudation in a, a few months, within a six months from the baseline, you can see that there was a great rate, a great uh, grow rate during the follow-up. You can see the enlargement uh, of the nevascularization in only five months. And you can see that this kind of macronevascularization was characterized by a very high rate of capillaries. So uh, completely different aspect at the baseline. And probably this was due to the different uh, uh, mechanisms at the basis of uh, the pathogenesis of these two different uh, kinds of vessels. Rick Spade uh, published this paper some years ago in which uh, he described the two different mechanisms at the basis of macronevascularization. The angiogenesis that is characterized by a um, very high rate of uh, capillaries and this mechanism uh, is uh, at the basis of macronevascularization with a great exudation from a clinical point of view. And uh, in the, on the other hand, there, is, there are macronovascularization characterized by arteriogenesis, in which there are only uh, great vessels with a low rate of capillaries and a low rate of only large exudation. vessels with very and low number of capillaries. In, uh, the group with the no exudation, the arteriogenesis. The, for this reason, we have tried to identify two different groups in non exudative macronovascularization. The quiescent group that are characterized by macronovascularization with no exudation for a very long period, uh, in which there is the arteriogenesis we have seen before. And uh, on the other hand, a group of uh, macronovascularization characterized by a very high rate of capillaries, uh, they are also characterized by exudation in a few months, and probably this is only the initial step in the normal nevascular network growth of type 1 macronevascularization. In fact, Donald Gass, uh, very, uh, I think that in uh, 1904, this is the book uh, of 1904, described the um, pathogenesis of type 1 macronevascularization, in which uh, at the beginning there is only a growth of the new vessel from the cardiocapillaries to the sub-RPE space with no exudation. And probably when you see that vessels, uh, you are in this kind of step. Uh, for this reason, after some months, there is exudation. So the take-home message of this part of my presentation is that macronovascularization could be diagnosed without exudation. And these are very high-risk lesions for the exudative neovascular MD. 
And for this, re for this reason, we need to characterize with different biomarkers this kind of macroendovascularization and different baseline features with uh, using OCT and geography may predict the short-term activation. So, uh, from a clinical point of view, if you have these uh, predictors, uh, you need to follow your patient very strictly in the first month of the follow-up. In the second part of my presentation, I would like to focus my attention on type 3 macular vascularization. Uh, type 3, the term type 3 was coined by Belly Freud in 2008, but uh, uh, there are several descriptions before of uh, this kind of no vessel. Uh, I think that everybody knows this publication of Larry Yannuzzi, in which uh, uh, he described retinal angiomatous proliferation. But uh, the first description of type 3 macronovascularization was uh, about nine years before by Harnett. Uh, this paper was published on archives. And uh, you know that uh, there are three different hypotheses at the basis of type 3 macular neovascularization, starting from uh, the retinal plexus, a deep vascular complex of the retinal plexuses, starting from the choroid, or starting from uh, uh, the retinal plexus and choroid together. But at the end, you have the same uh, um, lesion, a retinal choroidal anastomosis, uh, a connection between the uh, retinal plexus and the sub-RP space. Thanks to the introduction of multimodal imaging, uh, we know that uh, today that about uh, at least 99% of cases uh, the region is uh, intraretinal. Uh, and this was due thanks to the development of new high-resolution devices. Uh, as uh, Enrico told before, Type 3 macronovascularization in Western countries accounted for more than 30% of, uh, of macronovascularization in age-related macrodegeneration. So this is a very frequent scenario in uh, uh, your clinical practice, secondary only to type 1 macronovascularization. In this paper, uh, the group of Larry Yannuzzi described that in, after three year follow-up, uh, the disease is bilateral. So, if you have a unilateral type 3 macronovascularization at the baseline, in three years, uh, the uh, patients develop a macronovascularization, again, a type 3 macronovascularization, also in the fellow eye. But uh, thanks to the introduction of OCT and geography, we have described a new entity in this uh, collaborative study that we have, uh, told, we have called uh, this new entity as nascent type 3 macular neuroscalization. This is a patient affected by a small type 3 macular neuroscalization. You can see here the small hotspot in the late phases of uh, ICG angiography. On structural OCT, you can see the lesion starting from the deep capillary plexus going to the RPE. You can see uh, exudation in terms of small interretinal cyst, subretinal hyperreflective material, and increase in the neural retina. And using OCTA, you can see the presence of flow inside this lesion and also the neovascular network of the type 3 macronovascularization using a neovascular slab. But if we come back before the exudation, sorry, uh, you can see that there was uh, this uh, hyperreflective lesion that usually in our clinical practice uh, we say, okay, this is only a migration of the pigment of the, the retinal pigment epithelium. But if we perform an OCT angiography in this stage, you can see that there is flow inside this hyperreflective spot and also the neovascular network using uh, the NFAS uh, avascular slab. So this is not only pigment, this is an no vascularization with no exudation in the preclinical stage that we have called nascent type 3 no vascularization. And this is the progression of the nascent type 3 no vascularization. You can see that at the baseline there is no flow, no abnormal flow. And you can see here the development of a small uh, flow starting from the deep capillary plexus. And you can see the progression during the time going from the deep capillary plexus to the RPE space. And in this time, you can develop exudation. So before this uh, contact between the neovascularization and the RP, you don't have usually exudation, but you need to follow your patient because probably this kind of lesion could become exudative. And using 
these new informations uh, given by OCT and geography were perform another studies in order to investigate the fellow eye. So we have included, as uh, in the study of Larry and Nuzzi before, a patient with unilateral treatment naive type 3 macronevascularization in one eye, and we have followed the fellow eye. And we have seen that at the baseline, the fellow eye, uh, in 37% of cases, was characterized by a non exudative form of type 3 macronevascularization. Uh, this is an eye without exudation, without any kind of symptoms. And after a mean of nine months, the patient, the macronovascularization become exudative. In 21% of cases, uh, after about one year, there was a development before of a non-exudative stage of macronovascularization that became exudative again after a mean of eight months. In 21% of cases, there was directly um, exudative neovascularization after about two years, and 21% of cases did not develop any kind of uh, type 3 macronovascularization. So uh, the incidence of uh, the type 3 macronovascularization in the fellow eye was about 80% of cases. But uh, the most important thing from a clinical point of view is that if you analyze with OCT and geography the baseline, at the baseline, the fellow eye, and if you detect a non-exudative form of macronovascularization, probably uh, this eye will develop an, uh, an exudative type 3 macronovascularization in a few months, uh, within the first year of follow-up. So you need to follow your patient very strictly, because the probability of development of uh, type 3 macronovascularization, an exudative form of type 3 macronovascularization in the fellow eye was very high. But, yet, but if you perform an OCT and geography at the baseline, the fellow eye, and if you don't see any kind of uh, non-exudative macronovascularization, you can follow your patient with a longer follow-up because uh, probably the timing between the baseline and the development of uh, the type 3 macronovascularization in the fellow eye was longer, about two years in our study. So you can um, follow your patient not uh, every month, every two months at the beginning, but uh, you need to follow your patient strictly after the first year of uh, uh, follow-up. And this is an example. This is a patient affected by a drusen, in which uh, there was a, a development of nascent geographic atrophy at the baseline, because you can see the backscattering effect uh, below the drusen. And after that, there was again national geographic atrophy, but not only geographic atrophy, because there is a small hyperreflective focus with the flow using OCT and geography, so a nascent type 3 macronovascularization. And again, after that, an increase in the flow of uh, uh, the neovascularization with a contact with the RP space, and after that, the development of an exudative type 3 macronovascularization. So, Today, we are able to detect the preclinical stages of our neurosc exudative neurovascularization. The take home message of the second study so, is that type 3 macronovascularization is often a bilateral disease, uh, but uh, non exudative type 3 macronovascularization is a frequent scenario in the fellow eye of patients with uh, unilateral type 3 macronovascularization in the fellow eye. And so, for this reason, this biomarker should be the serial diagnostic approach and pro-treatment since 1% of patients develop exudation over a significantly shorter interval. I would like to show you um, another study in type 3 macronovascularization about the role of uh, subretinal and intraretinal fluid, because uh, uh, thanks also to the development of uh, new drugs in uh, uh, neovascular age-related macular degeneration, there is a great attention in the different uh, kind of fluid, interretina, sub-RPE, sub fluid. And we have um, uh, the previous studies demonstrated that usually sub fluid could play a positive role in patients affected by neovascular age-related macular degeneration. On the other hand, interretinal fluid could play a negative role. And this was due to the results of the VIEW uh, study. The VIEW study is uh, the registration trial of uh, a FLIBER set, you know, in which they reported that patients affected by intraretinal fluid at the baseline 
uh, were affected by a lower best corrective visual acuity at the baseline, lower gain of function during the follow-up, and the lower final best corrective visual acuity. So for this reason, intraretinal fluid is a, worse, uh, is a bad predictor in the uh, final outcome of patients. On the other hand, patients affected by subretinal fluid at the baseline were uh, uh, characterized by a greater improvement in best corrective visual acuity after the treatment and, uh, best fi and better final best corrective visual acuity at the end of the follow-up. So for this reason, we know that uh, subretinal fluid is a good predictor of visual outcome after the treatment. And starting from this study, there was, uh, there was performed another study that is, uh, is called the fluid study. Uh, it is uh, an Australian group in which they reported that we can tolerate some kind of subretinal fluid during the treatment of our patients because the final best corrective visual acuity is not different. I'm, I not agree with this study <laughs> and I will show you later why. The great problem of this study is that type 3 macronovascularization were greatly underestimated. Usually in clinical trials there is no distinction between type 1, 2 and 3 macronovascularization and when there is a distinction of type 3 macronovascularization uh, the rate of incident is not uh, real, only 2% of cases. We have seen before that type 3 macronovascularization characterizes about 30% of cases. So. Uh, for this reason, we have performed another study in order to understand the different predictors uh, of, visual, of final visual outcome in patients affected by type 3 macronovascularization treated by antivascular endothelial fatal injection. We have analyzed several uh, features uh, using mainly structural OCT. And here are the results. You can see that there was a decrease in best corrective visual acuity, and you know that uh, unfortunately patients affected by type 3 macronovascularization are characterized by the development of atrophy during the long-term follow-up, and for this reason you usually have a decrease in best corrective visual acuity also after the treatment. But I would like to give you some tips about uh, the predictors. Um, we have used a, a univariate analysis in order to uh, select the predictors uh, that uh, we have included in a multivariate analysis. And you can see here in uh, uh, blue different uh, predictors of final best corrective visual ac uh, acuity. The baseline best corrective visual ac acuity, this is, um, we know that patients with higher best corrective visual acuity at the baseline usually have a uh, better final best corrective visual acuity, the number of type 3 macular vascularization, and this is was yet reported in the literature, and the central macular thickness. But the most important thing is about the subretinal fluid. Because patients with subretinal fluid at the baseline were characterized by lower final best corrective visual acuity. So, in this series, in patients with type 3 macular vascularization, if you have subretinal fluid at the baseline, you will have a lower best corrective visual acuity at the end of the follow-up. And this is uh, the opposite in comparison to, to, to um, what was reported before. Sorry. Okay. So the take-home message of uh, this study is that the characterization of the macroendovascularization is of paramount importance uh, in the diagnosis uh, and also in the follow-up and the prognosis of uh, our patients. In fact, subretinal fluid is a good predictor only in type 1 and 2 macular vascularization. But on the other hand, this is an independent negative predictor of final best corrective visual acuity in type 3 macular vascularization. So, for this reason, patients affected by type 3 macular vascularization with subretinal fluid should be treated aggressively with no tolerance of subretinal fluid. And this is very important in your clinical practice. I would like to thank uh, all my co-workers of uh, San Rafaele Institute and uh, also from the Department of uh, Cretail. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>